Good morning and welcome to our Live Talk program. This is Lloyd Grubb here, your host on Revive Reform Radio, doing our Live Talk program covering wisdom for living on your Friday morning rise and shine. And this morning here, our topic is a so- soft answer turn into way wrath. Soft answer turn into way wrath is our topic for this morning. So welcome again to our Live Talk program as we share wisdom from the Word of God. Let us pray. Our Father, word in heaven, we thank thee again, dear Lord, for the blessings of your word. We thank you for the blessings, dear Lord, of knowing thee. Pray, Father, that you may continue to guide us in the principles of life that makes best um, for living. May you be with us, we pray for Christ's sake. Amen. And so our topic again this morning here is um, a soft answer. Turn it away, wrath, is what we're looking at here this morning as we look at Psalms chapter 15, verse 1 through 7, primarily looking at four verses there about the tongue and how to be able to communicate and uh, be able to have successful communication that will be a blessing to others and so just want to share a few wisdom here this morning so welcome again to our live talk program hopefully you had a blessed night last night you had some rest even an hour or two (laughs) and you're ready to take on today Um, and so um, we'll start off by reading psalm chapter Fifth, uh, Proverbs, sorry, Proverbs chapter 15, Proverbs 15, verse 1 through 7. Um, and it reads, a soft, a soft answer turned to weary wrath, but grievous words stir up anger. The tongue of the wise use it knowledge aright, but the mouth of fools pour it out foolishness. The eyes of the Lord are in every place, beholding the evil and the good. A wholesome tongue is a tree of life, but perverseness therein is the breach in the spirit. A fool despises his father's instruction, but he that regarded reproof is prudent. In the house of the righteous is much treasure, but in the revenue of the wicked is trouble. The lips of the wise disperse at knowledge, but the heart of the foolish do it not so. And so we our focus here this morning is going to be on Proverbs chapter 15, verse 1, 2, 4, and 7. And I'm going to read it again real quickly. So in Proverbs chapter 15, verse 1 is where we get our topic from. A soft uh, answer turneth away wrath, but grievous words stir up anger. And then the tongue of the wise use it knowledge you're right. That's beautiful. But uh, the mouth of fools pour it out to foolishness. It just keep coming out. Um, a wholesome tongue is a tree of life. But perverseness therein is a breach in the spirit. And verse 7, the lips of the wise disperse knowledge, but the heart of the foolish do it not so. They disperse foolishness. So this is where the Bible encourages us because um, some way some or the other, it's possible that we could have been in that situation or might have been in that situation. And so the Bible teaches us how to live. And this is the wisdom of the Bible that when embraced, and followed, you find that life is good. So we start out with our meditation for this morning here by looking at Proverbs again, 15 verse 1. Um, Now I'm going to read the second half. But grievous words stir up anger. Stir up anger. Now normally when I read this verse here, I normally say if a person comes to me and says something that is um, um, rough, then it stirs my anger up, right? You ever thought about that? But think about how the word, the, the verse is structured. It stirs up anger, but the um, it, it starts up by saying a sa- soft answer, a soft answer. So the answer. So normally, if there's an answer, there was a question that came before. How do you think about that? So normally, if there's an answer, there was a question that came before. Right? Yeah, you you get that? You know, it's profound, but it's very straightforward. It's not a soft question stir up anger. It's a soft answer that stirs up anger. So then it tells you that there was some action that happened before the answer that probably came in a very angry way. And the answer, if it comes out rough, will only stir whatever is already there. It's like normally if you stir something, there was something to be stirred, right? 
um, you had something already there you're working with. Normally you get some lemon juice, you get some water, and you get some sugar, and then you stir it. So you had to have something to stir in order to stir. And so there was something that's stirable. <laughs> and that's basically what the problem is. So what am I saying then? What I'm saying is that a soft answer, that means somebody come to you and they ask you a question. And they ask you it rough. And your action next is going to be what? It's going to become a further catalyst of the situation. Because it's not a, it's not a soft question it was said, it was a, you know, it's a soft answer. So somebody, they ask you a question. And you know, that can be very painful because um, there are individuals or anybody, even I can do it, where I'm asking a question, but the question, even no matter the tone I take, if I take an angry tone or not an angry tone, the question will lead to um, of an offense. The question is offensive. The question is going to cause anger. And so, and, and people, you know, look, a person can ask you a question um, and it was just their an, um, anger, you know, um, why are you worthless? You know, that, that, that's, that's a question, you know, somebody's coming to you and say, why are you so worthless? Uh-huh. That's an interesting question. <laughs> it's an interesting question. Um, that question, you know, it, it is, it is not really a question. <laughs> it's an accusation or it's a statement. Um, and so your answer to that um, is, 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 is stuff is going to go off. You know, stuff is going to start just popping off right away because that, that, that's a tough question. If somebody comes to you and say, you know, why, what, you know, why, you know, why you're a whore, uh, you know, or why, why, how, how much do you cost? You know, what's, what's the cost? Well, how much do, do you pay for favors? Um, the person is automatically saying you're a whore. Or a prostitute. So, how you answer that question? Uh, now, me answer that question with a rough answer. And then now it's going to be a fight. Because the question meant to cause a stir. And so, this is important. You know, there's many questions that I've known people will ask you. And you just have to stop and look at them. Because the question is so offensive. The question comes with a whole bunch of assumptions or conclusions or that the person already concludes certain negative things about you or about the situation that you're in. And so they're not asking a fair question. And people are very good with this. And they can ask it angry or they can ask it very calm. And you'll be like, man, why did they ask me that question? And so the Bible teaches us here. The Bible doesn't say that your question is the problem. The Bible says the question that was asked you. And you will go through this all the time. Your co-workers, your boss, your children, your family member, your spouse, they'll ask a question. The question comes with certain assumptions and conclusions. And they can be very painful. And so this is the tough part about the Bible. The Bible doesn't teach us that things must go smooth for us to have a smooth day. It teaches us how to take situations that are going out of control and turn them. So this is a powerful advice here for all of us. A soft answer, turn it away, rat. So the rat was coming. You see, it turned it away. It doesn't say a soft answer. Um, it's just going to keep things smooth. And they weren't smooth. It turned it away. The question that came, came in rat. And as I said, don't be fooled by a person's subtlety. Because some people are very subtle. In the way they ask your question, they won't give it to you angry, you know. And a lot of time, that's just the reality. Sometimes a person will fly in your face, but sometimes a person will sneak. They sneaky. They'll ask you a question, and the question comes over very sneaky. And 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 at first you think about the question, and then when the question hits your mind, because sometimes it goes over your head, and then when it goes over your head and it fly one, when it fly back and hit you in your head, you'll be like, "What did the person just ask me?" And the next res response is supposed to be a soft answer. That's what the Bible is teaching. Because you, the person is asking you in anger. You know, somebody's talking to you. Your phone ring, they pick up the phone and say, I have a question for you. Oh, here we go. Uh, no, uh, it's not, hey, good morning, how are you doing? And just start talking. It's, I have a question for you. 
And that the moment you're supposed to get so good at this that you brace yourself and you just already re recount in your mind soft answer. I'm going to give this person a soft answer. Uh, what I normally do is something you have to pause or normally uh, in that situation, I have to ask them another question. Uh, clarify for me. Or pause and don't answer immediately. Because you, you got to swallow, swallow some spit. You got to... Uh, take a big gulp <laughs> and 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 you know make your nerves calm down a little bit because your blood pressure is going to spike so a soft answer turned away right this is so important this is one of those bible texts that um you know this is something to be practiced and to be mastered because this is one of the most difficult because these questions don't come at you they don't give you enough time you don't have um you know, minutes or hours to ponder the question. Most of the time when a tough question comes your way, you have seconds. And sometimes if the question comes fast enough, it's probably split seconds. It's really quick. And so you can't, you can't really, um, you have to just get into mode. You have to get so good at this that you just go into mode. You, you know, your, your automation take over. Your brain in split seconds say, hey, this is the answer. Uh, what's the answer? Silence. This is why they say silence is golden. Many questions are not worth answering immediately, especially. Because sometimes even the question a person asks is no, it's not a question, it's just an accusation. And so you answer it is just, you know, hell is gonna break loose as they say. You pull back. The other way, as I say, is you ask a question. You calm your nerves down and simply ask a question. Clarify for me. And um I give the person time to not feed you know give it time so that you don't feed their emotion because if you feed their emotion this is where it's going to go because the person is asking question because they want to give you a piece of their mind and they want to accuse you of something very brutal and because they're settling their mind this is the reality and they're going to treat you probably rough so you you need to slow them down or stop them by just not answering um and even if they get angry because you didn't answer them then to feed that it works and you just have to do it. This text here is rock solid. It's a rock solid text in the all the text in the Bible is rock solid. But I'm saying it's one of those texts in the Bible that it's it's the mastery. You know, people talk about diet. Diet is important, but you see, controlling tongue is important. Somebody said, Well, was Adam and Eve tempted on food? Yeah. But if you read the temptation, she got caught in her words. See, sometimes there's things that you don't need to give an answer for. The devil came to you and asked you a question. Don't be so quick to answer. I always say to people, when I ask a question, uh, the person that first answered the question most of the time got it, gets, gets it wrong. M most of the time. If I ask a hundred questions, I sorry, one question, if, you know, I don't know, whatever, a, a multiple questions, the person that always answer first most of the time get it wrong because that's the person that never thought the question through. What is he asking? Because if I'm asking a question, there must be some type of twist to what I'm asking. You know, obviously, if I know the right, if the, if the answer is so obvious, then probably I wouldn't ask the question. It's not a question worth asking. You know, if, if you know, why is the sun yellow or whatever? I, I mean, some questions is just not worth asking. So when a person comes and asks you a question and the question comes a certain way, most of the time it's just best not to answer immediately or answer at all. Because they're not asking you a question. They're, there's something they want to get to. So try to ask them a question to get to it. Or just be silent. And this is the master. So when Adam and Eve was tempted, somebody would say, well, it was about food. Not really. Uh, the, the trick there was, uh, there are times when, if you don't know the proper answer, you need to, um, you know, wait. Let me get back to you. Or don't answer. Or answer. Or, or ask a question. Why are you asking me that? Okay. Well, that question seemed kind of tricky. Let me get to Adam and ask him. And then if Adam can't answer the question, say, Adam said, let me get to God. But when we are quick to answer stuff, trouble comes. So, as I say, our topic this morning is soft, soft answer turned away. Right? Going to be our main, main focus, but um, we're going to touch on some of these other wisdom here. The second part says, but grievous words stir up anger. So turn away wrath, stir up anger. So the anger is there already. The, the wrath is coming towards you. 
the higher the, 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 the frustration, the bitterness, the pain that the person is feeling. They're about to give you some of that pain. They're going to share it with you. And you are going to try to help them out. Even if they probably deserve to get a piece of your mind. Because they shouldn't ask you that question. They should first investigate to make sure whatever they're coming at you is real. Or even if it's real, they don't need to treat you that way because they love you. <laughs> but at the end of the day, this is the reality. And so turn it away, right? Grievous words stir up anger. It just rise the anger up. So somebody comes to you and they ask you something and it's an accusation and they ask you a question. And you give them an answer. Or you give them an answer. Boy, you give it to them. You know, how dare you ask me to see you, whatever. And you give it to them. And they know, they don't back down. They'll be like, you stir me. I'm going to give it to you back now. And they give it to you back. And then the two of you start to give each other a, a good mental verbal whipping. And when you finish, you just almost hate each other. Because guess what happened? The two of you just said some of the worst things to each other that just caused a lot of wounds, a lot of pain. Make you stay up at night and think about what the person has said to you. But simply, if the second act was silence or softly answer the person to turn away the right to calm the person down, then there you have it. This is a situation. So this is what the Bible encourages and it makes absolute sense. And when you do it, you will affirm that the word of God is good <laughs> and God is good. Um, verse 2 says, the tongue of the wise use that knowledge right. So the tongue of the wise use that knowledge right. So, and the second part says, but the mouth of fools pour it out foolishness. It just comes out. It's just, it's just garbage. It just goes, yeah. You know, I would say they like vomit on you. Um, and so the tongue of the wise use that knowledge right. So it, knowledge is, is, is neutral, so to speak. Um, but you can use it a certain way. You know, you can say things a certain way. You can't say it at the right time. You know, they say there's a time and a place for everything. Um, you know, so somebody say, I'm just stating a fact. No, no, no. There are certain facts that can be stated at the wrong time. Time in all, often time is everything. So somebody say, I'm just stating the information. No, you're not. You're using the, the knowledge um, wrong. So knowledge can be used wrong. It can be used at the wrong time and the wrong situation. Um, and, and, and one has to be careful with this. You know, there is a situation where somebody would say, um, like you see this a lot of times where somebody go to a funeral and they go to the funeral and they use it not, not at the wrong time. So they go to a funeral and somebody's preaching that a person is in heaven right now. And you're looking and you say, well, there's the body. How they in heaven? But yeah, but it's just not a time and place. You know, it's the time and place in another place. So you go to a wedding and you think, you think you, 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 that, you know, this young lady shouldn't be married to this young man. You talk to her, you tell her, hey, look, I think you're making a blunder. This is a bad mistake you're making. A person said, no, I'm going to go ahead and get married. Now it's time for the wedding and the pastor stands there and says, if anyone have any reason why these two should not be joined together. <laughs> and you go right in the head and say, yeah, I have a reason why. <laughs> and you go and blurt it out. Uh, it's knowledge, but it's just you being foolish. And it's, it's, it's a difficult thing to explain to a person that is foolish, as the Bible says, a fool. Um, that is not that... What you're saying it might not be true, but you know that there's a time where you need to shut up. <laughs> there's a time where you need to keep quiet. And they're like, no, I'm going to tell them. Uh, yeah, but it's not the right time. You already had the opportunity the person decide to make their mind up. There's just no reason for you to say anything at this point. You already said your piece. Just go ahead and go to the, if you're going to go to the wedding, go ahead and go there and then uh, enjoy some food and tell them, God bless you in your marriage. <laughs> and then that's it. But there's a time and a place for things. So you could have knowledge in something. You could have knowledge and in some information. How about in a situation where somebody's talking and they're saying something that is wrong? And you know, whether it be 
uh, historically, scientifically, um, whatever. There's not saying it right, but it's just not the time or the place or the right way to use the information. Um, and somebody said, but aren't you covering the truth? Normally, when people talk like that, they're, they're immature. They don't understand, you know, the tongue of the wise, use it, the knowledge, right? There's a way to use the information. There's a way to use knowledge in the right way. There's a way you can use it in the wrong way. Um, also, there's a way to apply knowledge to situation that is appropriate. But a fool doesn't know how to do this. They don't know how to use it. It's like a tool. It, it doesn't. It is just information. But you can use it right, you know. And so, but the mother fools poured out foolishness, just talking. It might be what they're saying is right, and it is the true reality, but it is just they're not using it properly. And you see this over and over again. You know, what's potent in church, and have you seen this, is that you give a person a little Bible. You know, they start to learn a little Bible, and they start to go around and beat it over the head with people. And then you say to them, well, no, don't do that. And they think, oh, you're not being strong or bold, and you're thinking, no. Your problem is you're foolish. That's what a problem is. You're not using the knowledge right. That's not the way to do that. You know, and and that, that's what it is. You know, you start teach them. And I think that's why the teaching of, you know, say about the Antichrist or the Mark of the Bees um, catches fools all the time. And also they use it improperly because they use it to whack people over the head. And that's just the problem. And then you say, and if you try to talk to them, they try to think probably you're trying to, um, you know, put down the truth or not share the knowledge with people. And you're really trying to explain to them and you can't get to them because they're so foolish that, no, no, it's not. That is the problem. This problem is you're being a fool. That's just it. It has nothing to do with the information. It has nothing to do with truth. It has nothing to do with the Bible. It has nothing to do with anything. It has to do with, no, what you need to do is stop being foolish. You're being dumb. And it, it, they get it cross here because they're so foolish again and their reason is so off that they think probably you're speaking against their sharing knowledge with people. They're getting people truth. And they're not realizing it's just you're, you're, you're foolish and now you went from being a secular foolish person to a religious foolish person. And your actions and the behavior is just foolish. That's a problem. It's just, it's just, it's just that's a problem. You need to go study the Psalms and Proverbs and pray to God for wisdom so your behavior will match a person that is a righteous person. That's all. So when you understand this, you understand how it's, it's not, you know, somebody talk, you be like, wow, they live a reason. And you can see this even more clearly sometimes in Bible class and like in Bible studies, Sabbath school st lesson study. Is that the person that grasping the information and what comes out of the mouth is just arguments. And I've noticed over the years that's what happened where um where you just giving people things like prophecy study and stuff like that and they're just learning but they never interact with the truth. That means they don't learn to discuss the truth. And what happened in that situation, the person head is full without the information, but they don't know how to use it right. And you go in situations and if there's a discussion, it's pure argument. Or they start to argue the Bible and argue truth and argue what Ellen G. White writes. And they argue a lot of stuff. And big, big argument, big fights. And when you listen to their line of reasoning, the way they reason, their reasoning level is so childish and so foolish I, that they think what it is you're trying to argue with them with the truth they're pouring forth. And they don't realize... No, the problem is their level of reasoning. That's why I like doing I like doing this. But actually the thing I love the most is when I'm interacting with the people I'm teaching because it sharpens me more and it makes me become better user of truth and knowledge. And but it sharpens them also because they get their they get to exercise reasoning because an unreasonable person will never really properly understand the Bible. And I've seen this happen over and over again. I, I could tell you, I could go to just any group. And if they're arguing too much, what happened? They don't know how to reason the Bible. They don't know how to use the knowledge. It's just a lot of information in their minds. But it's not logically 
put together so it creates arguments and what it is is that the only way to get rid of this in the mind is actually for the mind to be challenged by discussions by bible study where it's interactive you know where i remember years back i can't remember who it was say someone was saying that they don't they prefer the bible studies where they have to people have to fill in the questions per se and then you kind of challenge them on it like make them think what they're filling in it can be a straightforward question like the question um you know john chapter 3 verse 16 what did god love and the person read it and say oh the world yeah, that too is too straightforward the person doesn't learn to reason the person become like very one dimensional in their thinking this is why people who are unreasonable prefer the bible as a, something that is like very mechanical you know just memorize the bible that's salvation but if you said but do you understand what it takes you just memorize no that's that's when you start use truth in a bad way truth has to be reason has to be lived out it has to be you know fluid it has to be something that you just applied per the situation but if you just have the information in your head you don't know how to use it it's just so you just don't use it right and uh, so this is why again but the mouth of full port for it, foolishness but the tongue of the wise use it knowledge aright it's something to be used it's something that has to be applied situation so this is why like i always find it fascinating like when you study with people who know the right answer they do not know to reason the bible uh, I've, you know, some I, I've I've studied in the past with like Jehovah Witness, and they're they're very good at answering whatever the, the teacher teach them. But if you come at them from twenty different angles, uh, they just get flat footed and f frustrated and flustered because they don't know how to use it. They can't apply. It. They just know if you ask them this question, this is the answer. Ask them this question, this is the answer. So I I do a lot of talking, so I reverse all kind of questions on them. They never can answer it because they don't know. And I'm talking about elders and leaders in the church. They don't know. Um, because they have a very mechanical way of studying the Bible. The Bible is not life. The Bible is it's not living. It's not the living word of God. It's just a book to memorize. Um, anyhow, but there's much more we could say than that. That's a, as a study in itself and to study people. I guarantee, as I say, you go places where there's a lot of argument back and forth. You always go back down to people don't know to use the truth all right they don't know to apply it it's not wisdom it's just knowledge and information wisdom is applying knowledge and information for life decisions so proverbs chapter 15 verse 4 says a wholesome tongue is a tree of life but perverseness therein is a breach in the spirit notice not a breach in a wall or breach anywhere else it's a breach in the spirit because when a person is perverse and they speak all kind of you know rubbish as they say when they talk oh man it just gets you down it just beats you down but the, the difference here is that when you're you have a wholesome tongue is a tree of life that means when you talk to somebody and deal with somebody that is um is is you know given life by the words it just builds you up it builds you up so a wholesome tongue um, but when the person is perverse, always oh, a breach in the spirit is just it just it's just it's just they hammer you, and 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 always think when a person does this or live like this, I say, what is it like for others to live with them? Because everything you deal with them, they just get to you because they're gonna put they're gonna put like they're gonna occupy space in your brain. All of a sudden, they go say something, and it's just gonna keep going over and over in your mind. And it just gets you done because, like, was that necessary? Did they have to say that to me? Then I take that thought the next level. The next level, I say, what is it like for them to live in their own head? Because if that's the way they think, I see why some people are so depressed. Because every every day you get up and you just breach in your own spirit, because they're living it with themselves twenty four hours. See, at least they're. Well, their children don't get a break until they start going to school. Praise the Lord for school. Amen for school. Because some people, it's just praise the Lord when the kids get to get away and go to school and be away from them. At least for eight hours, they're not being depressed. But imagine now, they, for the rest of their life, have to live with themselves. And this is why many people hate themselves and are so depressed. Because their thoughts is thus perverse. 
It's just when they open the mouth, you'll be like, why did you say it? That's what you think? And you live with yourself? And then you realize the person said, no, I don't want, actually, I want to kill myself because I'm tired of myself. I, I, it's just the same way you're offended with me and you, you want to run away from me. I want to run away from me. But the problem is I can't escape me because me's my head. And so what happened? The person gets to a point where they'd be like, no, I'm going to have to get rid of this problem. So how are you going to do it? I'm going to blow my brains out. Because that's just, it's a breach in the spirit, but they're breaching the spirit 24 hours a day. Oh, uh, yeah, I forget they have to sleep. But something you get so sick in your head that you could even sleep and your sleep is depressing because of the dreams. And so we want to have a wholesome spirit. As as you say, a soft answer turned away rat. Most naturally, if you're thinking on wholesome thoughts all the day long, even questions when people ask you that are not, and I'm sure you've seen this, questions that people ask a person that are not unwholesome questions, they're not trying to offend them. The person, because they're such a terrible spirit and they're always thinking so much evil or negativity, they just always pour forth out of their mouth some pain. And it's just going to cause pain. But, you know, when you have awesome thoughts, then that's a tree of life. But again, it's, if it's a tree of life to those that come around you, then your thoughts are a tree of life to yourself because it's all in the thoughts. And the more you develop into Christianity, the more you'll find that it's all centered around the thinking. Everything is centered around the thinking. And so when you have wholesome thoughts, and it's a tree of life, then around us becomes like the Garden of Eden. And that's where we want to be. We want to be able to have heaven and earth. And it's always start in our own atmosphere, in our heads. And the moment we have that in our heads, then all of a sudden it started to translate to those around us. And then we can get to live with somebody or some people that is trained to number one, verse one, give a soft answer. And then verse four, that their mouth become a tree of life. Then a lot of the pain that is seen in the earth just disappear. It's what the earth needs. People who their mouth is not always just pouring food. Evil. More than that in a little bit. So that's what is needed. You know, somebody say, well, I'm not happy. Well, first, what does that mean? Are you not happy because those around you make you unhappy? Or are you happy in your own mind when you're by yourself? Because that's where happiness starts. It's not so much others. If your happiness is um, is based upon somebody that's making you happy, then you're truly not happy. Happiness and wholesomeness and peace of mind starts within my head. It's all in your head. You know, somebody go to the doctor and they say, no, doctor, my knee hurts. And the doctor check it out and say, hey, no, I think that's in your head. <laughs> but it's the same thing with happiness. It's in your head. It's one thing to be unhappy. And it's one thing where you could be in a situation and people occupy space in your mind. But again, if that becomes, can be eclipsed by your thoughts what are your thoughts this morning or your thoughts as you go through the day analyze yourself are you happy if happiness was to be dependent upon you if you were going to be my tree of life would i be happy if i have to speak to you would i receive from you happiness and that becomes the point but if i speak to you and every time i speak to you I feel depressed. There's a certain point where no matter how much I love you, without consciously thinking, even subconsciously, I'm going to start to avoid you because I know to talk to you is pain. But worse yet, you have to think about it in yourself. How are you? Are you happy when you're around you? <laughs> when you're with you? Because that's where true happiness. And if you're not happy, jump around and be jolly like a little butterfly. Are you even at peace? Are you content? Or when you're by yourself with your own thoughts, the thoughts are very scary and very depressing and very just, you know, if I had those thoughts or I hear you verbalize the thoughts, I would be depressed. Then that's where the Bible is saying you got to make that change. You got to not just pray to ask the Spirit to come into your life, but you start to exercise 
mental self-control. And as you exercise mental control, then what happens? It will affect your tongue. And your tongue now will say the words. Say the words. But I've never met a person who was unhappy and it wasn't because of their selves. Somebody could say, but can somebody do things to you? Yeah, but again, somebody can rape you verbally, physically, you know, various different ways. But unless they're tying a dungeon, and that's what they're doing to you constant, constantly, if you're a free human being, you're walking around free, that doesn't continue all day long. And so you have to stop and not make events of the past occupy space in your mind. So somebody said, but what if I'm in a situation? Well, you know, whatever it is today won't be tomorrow. You have to know that you could be in a bad situation, but it won't be there tomorrow. So you would have to make up your mind that whatever situation you're in, if it is a situation that's changeable, you might be in it today, but not tomorrow. Whatever I'm being my dad. And nothing in this world is permanent. So if you have a life and you have freedom of choice, there's a point where you know, you know, I'm not happy in this situation and you give it your best shot. And if it doesn't work, you just move on. But your happiness is on you. And so if you want to fill this text in, you want to make this text become, as I say, the, the word became flesh and dwell among us. Well, I want to encourage you, be this person here, that your tongue become a tree of life. And when you speak, it makes people live a little bit longer. As I say, I've I've conversation, and I you know my thought is I can live. And somebody <laughs> somebody say what what do you mean you can live? And I'm like I can live, you know. And and what do I mean by that? What I mean by that is, <laughs> if I was about to commit suicide, and I talk to a certain person, a dear tongue is old some. And their tongue is a tree of life. After talking to them, I can smile and say, I can live. I can live. This this is workable. I, I can live another day. This is good. And that's what a tree of life is. You're about to die. You go over there, you pick a fruit off the tree. And you eat it. And your life is extended. And that's what it is. You know, and most of the time I say it with some food. You know, I eat some food and food tastes good. I'll be like... Yeah, I could live another day. <laughs> I could eat this another day. <laughs> this tastes good. This really encourages life. And that's how you want to see yourself. You want to see yourself that if a person was near perishing, that you are going to be the one to make them come over to you and they're going to pick a fruit right out of your mouth and they're going to eat that fruit and they're going to be like, you know what, Ben? I, I ain't going to die today. I'm going to live another day. That's what you want to be. Now somebody say, how is that possible? Notice again, Proverbs chapter 15, verse 1. A soft answer turned away wrath, but grievous words stir up anger. Okay, so, so you're thinking, what has to do with that? Remember, sometimes a person that is talking a lot of mess, as they say to you, a lot of you know things that will make you get angry, and then you're going to give them a rough answer. Or people sometimes are actually suicidal and depressed. And that's just the reality. So you're dealing with somebody that's suicidal and depressed. Now somebody will say, Lord, you're certain? Because this person here, they're not depressed or suicide. They're trying to make everybody as depressed and suicide. Actually, no, many times, I'm going to say this is all the time, but I've found a lot of times that people who will get you down by occupying negative space, they say some of the most discouraging defeatist statements out of their mouth when you analyze them and if you talk to them privately you can trust me because you know as a pastor people say these things to me so i encourage you i'm encouraging you here know that when you're talking to a person oftentimes they just say some of the most discouraging depressing stuff that they themselves are having serious struggle with suicide they themselves are having serious struggle with depression and so they're about to faint or they're about to die. And the statement they're making is de they're making actually defeat the statement. It's just that they're making it to you. And so the, the best thing to do for them, God bless you in your effort. I'm blessing you before I even say what, <laughs> what you need to do, is you need to learn to calm them down by saying a soft answer.
You saying an angry word to them, it just encourages them that life is depressing. It's like they want you to validate their darkness. They want you to validate their depression. And you need to calm them down. But in order to do this, you have to take a hit. And I'm not saying, I say, God bless you in your effort because, they, you know, people in that state of mind that they're not addressing their depression, they'll hit you left, right, and center up your head. They just keep hitting you that it makes you be afraid of them because you know every time you see them, you're like, here we go. And it's going to give you a darkness because that's the darkness they're struggling with. And their mouth is just going to pour forth the foolishness. So know that. But, you know, know also that you're sometimes the only person they're going to deal with that's going to give them life. Everybody else, as they give it to the person, the person is going to give it back to them. And the more the person gives it back to them, is the more they get depressed because they get angry. They start to foam at the mouth. They start to open up their minds so that the devil can get inside of them and possess them. And the devil just take a hold of them and they just start to pour forth more darkness. Sad, sad but that's the reality. So I, the, the wholesome tongue is a tree of life. But perverseness therein is the breach in the spirit. It's the perverseness. And it's just the thought that they thought think all day long. So this is why you learn that a soft answer turned away right. And you help a person that's about to perish. Help a person that is just, as I say, somebody will hear this and say, no, there's some people that are just angry. Yeah, they're angry, but you never see a hungry, happy person. Oh, some people just depressed. Yeah, they're depressed. But oftentimes that depression, if not today, because they haven't dealt with it over their lifetime, if they don't deal with those depressing thoughts, tomorrow or a year or five years from now, it grows because the mind is learning to go to the, you know, the, the depressed state. And that's now we go from, I'm getting fed up of this, I want to kill myself. So trust me, it's important for you to try to help the person, lift them up a little bit. But this is what heaven and earth is like. So again, if you say my marriage is not the happiest, well, I'm going to tell you how you get your marriage the happiest. You start to make your words become a tree of life. Because what it is, is that our happiness is primarily derived from each other, not from social media, not even from the radio I'm doing here. And so when you start to pour forth happy words, not always negative, always, you know, saying the, the first thing out of your mouth is something that is just combative and making your, your house a hell and then don't understand why you're unhappy. Um, the moment you start to learn to just say things that are positive or lift, lifting and making your mouth become a guard of Eden, then God will bless you. Verse 7 simply states that the lips of the wise disperse knowledge, but the heart of the foolish do it. Not so. Now, I love how Proverbs is written because it flips. It doesn't say um, the mouth of the foolish do it not so. Because remember, it's very clear, especially from teachings of Christ, that the problem is not with the mouth per se. The problem is with the heart. It's what the thinking is. Is what the person loves. The person, I don't know, probably if he's satisfied in their heart when they think dark thoughts. Get used to it. Just like how somebody could be Got used to watching horror movies. I used to. And, you know, uh, I think it affected me because I just got used as a young man to watch a lot of crazy movies. And um, I still would walk in the dark at night. I could walk in just the middle of the dark on a pad where there's no, 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 no street lights, no there's trees around and just walk in the darkness. And this is how dark the mind can get. Just lost in my sins. And God has to deliver your mind from that type of stuff. Because when your mind becomes so darkened um, that, you know, you, you don't even fear going into fearful areas. Uh, you're becoming foolish. But the heart of the foolish, do it not so. So what is the wise doing? The lips of the wise disperse knowledge. Not foolishness. Not using knowledge wrongfully, but they disperse it. Give some information, teach somebody something. And when you start doing that, what it is that doing there is that when you start dispersing knowledge, what it is it make you become, it make your mind become trained on certain thoughts. Uh, and that's important. I believe that's why work is so important because 
if our minds were just left idly to think about some of the things that we would go on, this world would be a darker place. But sometimes just gathering up knowledge and share it with others, you get to give somebody something. You know, like sitting is having a conversation how a bearing, how a bearing work. You know, uh, one day you can tell me if if you know how. All right, how a bearing work? It's probably obvious, but you could describe the mechanism. And just having a conversation, say for half an hour, talking to somebody about a bearing work, and you finish. And so you think, wait a minute, we just talked about a bearing, how bearing work, yeah. It just takes your mind off a lot of nonsense. And it occupies your mind with something that's not evil, not sinful, not anything. So it's good to disperse knowledge, all knowledge. So now I'm going to read with you James chapter 3, verse 1 through 18. James chapter 3, verse 1 through 18 becomes very straightforward when we, you know, think about the things that I've said so far in the text that I've applied. And we're going to get a very beautiful lesson from the book of James chapter 3. Verse 1 through 18. And listen to the wisdom now that pours forth from James. My brethren, be not, ma be not many masters, knowing that we shall receive the greater condemnation. So, you know, many people always run up and they want to be teachers. And he's saying, look, uh, be careful of that because um, greater condemnation. That means a person in the pew, if they follow a false teacher, will be punished by the the teacher himself will have greater punishment, right? So my brethren, be not many masters, knowing that we shall receive the greater condemnation. For in many things we offend all. If any man offend not in word, the same is a perfect man and is able also to bridle the whole body. Now let's go back to what I was talking about earlier in the beginning. Remember, Adam and Eve, the issue was bridle the tongue. Don't be so quick to talk. And you, somebody said, that, that happened almost 6,000 years ago. Why is that so important? Notice he says there a person that can bridle the tongue. is a perfect man. You know, we start off with diet, but we grow from there. We start to learn to control what we say. And how we say it, you bridle the tongue. But here, bridle it, you control it. Put a bridle in it so you can have control over it. And is also able to bridle the whole body. That's why if you see a person that's out of control with their diet, they're also out of control with their talking. They'll run them out. The person that bridle the tongue can bridle the, 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 the diet because, again, it's a self-control issue. And so if you see there, and if you notice here, even back in the story of Adam and Eve, you put a group of people in a room, male and female, you throw something out, you watch who will be the first to talk and who will talk the most. And you can quickly see that the story of Adam and Eve is true. Now, in verse 3, Behold, we put bits in the horse's mouth, that they may obey us, and we turn about their whole bodies. Behold, also the ship, which though they be so great, and are driven by fierce winds, yet are they turned about with a very small helm, whithersoever the governor listed. Even so, the tongue is, lit, is a little member, and boasts at great things. Behold, how great a matter a little fire kindled. And that's true, a little spark. Psst, and all of a sudden, the whole house is burning down. A little spark. A little spark will definitely burn the house down. You don't believe that? <laughs> and so, <laughs> and that's just the reality. And, you know, it just takes a little thing and then the whole house is good burned down. And verse 6, and a tongue is a fire, a world of iniquity. So is a tongue among our members that it defiled the whole body and set it on fire the course of nature. And it is set on fire of hell and literally... <laughs> He says it here so powerfully. It is set on fire of hell. Person start talking and it's like, you know, when in the Old Testament, they would, yeah, the coal was lit from heaven and that coal had to be holy fire in the, in the sanctuary. But when the tongue started to speak, it's like uh, unholy fire from hell. And, um, and <laughs> they, the, the, it just, when the person opened the mouth, you'd be like, Wow. Wow. Trouble start. 
And this is why it says grievous words stir up anger. You have to turn that wrath away. Because the person started in hell start. Uh, verse 7 says, For every kind of beast and of birds and of serpents and of things in the sea is tamed and had be tamed of mankind. And I find that fascinating how they can tame killer whales, tigers, lions, and so forth. But, but the tongue, verse 8, can no man tame. It is an unruly evil, full of deadly poison. Therewith bless we God, even the Father, and therewith curse we men, which are made after the similitude of God. Out of the same mouth proceeded blessings and cursing. My brethren, these things ought not to be. Not to be. Um, that a fountain sent forth at the same place sweet water and bitter. Can the fig tree, my brethren, bear olive berries? Eat either a vine fig, so can a fountain both yield salt water and fresh water. So just pause here a little bit. So this is where the problem is. Where we talk about soft answer and about the mud of the fool poured for it, poured for it, foolishness. And um, that's just the reality. It's if if one has to check himself, and that's why I love the Bible. I always love hearing people talk about the heavy hitters. In the Bible, they say we gotta study prophecy because prophecy, <laughs> prophecy is heavy, uh, is meat, and this type of text is milk. You know where are you getting in the prophetic writing where it says that if you can't control your mouth, you're a perfect man. Huh? You know how many people are gonna be divorced today? And it wasn't everything, anything over adultery and anything like that. It's just about the mouth, the tongue, unruly. It just destroy the whole house, plunk the whole house down, tear it down, destroy it by just saying stuff that normally in anger, normally heart rate goes so high and gets so angry that this just say stuff just to cause pain and hurt that can't be retracted. So again, it, this is where the control comes in when you understand what the creme de la creme of Christianity is. It is the control of the man is self control. It is getting your mind and your heart under the spirit that under split seconds you're able to submit to Jesus. You're able to submit to the spirit and let the spirit lead and not give yourself over to hell and let hell lead. This is the very important thing. It is the most important thing. As I say, test yourself. When there's a question, when there's an issue comes up, Practice, pull back, say nothing, think about the question, think about the situation, don't be the first to talk. I practice this. You just sit there and observe. And you'll find when you do this, what will happen is that you're making the practice that when that split second decision comes up, you're able to bridle. And that's where perfection comes in because perfection is control over the spirit. I've noticed over the years that as I walk with the Lord that this level of control becomes increased to the point that I'm surprised how much this thing works. It really works. And it's just, it's, it boggles the mind of split fast the brain can work in just not getting answers out but in controlling the spirit. Because I'm telling you, you can be so controlled by emotions that you think you're giving a sensible answer. It's not sensible. It's just a total emotional answer. But somebody said, but I'm, I'm intellectually answering the question. No, you're not. You're emotionally answering the question because you committed too fast. That's not intellect. You need time to think. And the split-second decision is not opening your mouth. The split-second decision is, let me think about this. And then you'll find that you bridle your tongue, you pull it back. But not be so quick. What well, the Bible said we're supposed to be slow to speak. That's what the Bible teaches. It's important to be slow to speak. You know, we have to think first. But I, I see it all the time. You can, you know, they talk about talk about group dynamics. You go in a group and you watch. You throw any questions out, you watch the group dynamics. And you see who's gonna just jump and answer. And you say, okay, watch that person. That person does that 
and you do that two, three times, you say that person does it all the time in their lives. And they have all kind of problems. And they have all kind of self-control problems in other parts of their lives because they're too quick to answer. They feel like they should be the first to answer because they know it all. And normally, they normally if they're quick to answer, they normally assume also why you're asking the question. They don't even know why you ask the question. They jump to an assumption and they don't, they don't answer the question. They answer the assumption. You, you, you get that? Now, if you get it, observe it. Just mark what I'm saying here. And, and you could say, well, you heard me talk for an hour. I'm going to tell you, if you have to listen to this again, listen to this again. And if you have to say it five, ten times, listen to it and then observe people and you'll see or observe yourself. And then you'll be like, wow, I really do that. I'm going to tell you, a lot of time the person is not answering the question. They're answering their assumption for why you're asking the question. I ask a question, the answer, and the answer is not nothing to do with the question. It has to do with the assumptions that they assume from based upon why I'm asking the question. And so, so it says here now, if we can wrap this up here in a few minutes. It says that the fountain bring forth the same place, sweet water and bitter water. Can a fig tree, verse 13. Who is a wise man and endue with knowledge among us? Let him show out his show out of a good conversation his works with meekness and wisdom. This will lock right into Proverbs chapter 15. Notice his works with meekness and wisdom because it's humility that will make us pull back, make us not give an answer that is rough. We humble ourselves. Because remember, you, humility is needed when you have a right to exercise authority or a right to exercise your rights. See, you don't have to humble yourself. There's no need to humble yourself. It's when you're in a need not to give a rough answer because you should give a rough answer that humility comes in and say, humble yourself, do the wise thing. Because what the person is saying here, you're only going to go south. 14, but if you have bitter envy and strife in your hearts, glory not, align not against the truth. Because that's all it's going to do. Somebody hear me talk here and they're like, oh no, it's all right in their mouth. They're just lying against the truth. This is, this, is, this is master level thing I'm talking about here. You can go to any shaman or any yoga or anything. There ain't nothing. It is like lightweight stuff. This is master stuff I'm talking about here. When you get to a point where you can bridle the thought, bridle the tongue, where somebody can come at you hard, and you can take a breath and not answer, even though even though you know they're wrong, and you can pull back. That's master level. It's not emptying the mind and going away and meditating. No, you're in the crucible. You're in the fire. The person is coming at you and just like foaming at the mouth. And they're wrong. And you still can be like, I hold your peace. That's where you come to a level of mastery. You don't have to need, you don't need to be in the mountaintop. You're in the valley and things are rough. And you can maintain your spirit. That's where I want to be. That's where I want to learn. You don't learn that without exercise. You have to practice it. Yeah, you got to, somebody have to get to your last nerves and they have no right to do that to you and you still hold your peace. That's where I want to be because that's how you get to master level. What kind of master level I'm talking about? The master of heaven. So our Christ was able to hold his peace on the cross. We'll see if we can finish this before the time elapses on us. It says the wisdom of, the wisdom, this wisdom, this kind of glory in in, in, in unrighteousness. The wisdom descended not from above, but is earthly, sensual, devilish. For where envy and strife is, there is confusion in every evil work. But the wisdom is that is from above is first pure, then peaceably, gentle, easily entreated, full of mercy and good fruits, without partiality and without hypocrisy. And the fruit of righteousness is sown in peace. Of them that make peace. Notice here, the wisdom of God is easily entreated. Somebody that you can't talk to, that's a person that is lost. You know, question about that. You can't talk to the person, you can't entreat them, you can't, oh, you calm down, relax yourself. The devil has control of them. 
and they need to find the Lord. Let's pray. Our Father, what in heaven, we pray that, Father, that truly we may receive of thy spirit, that you may be able to have a hold on us, that in times, dear Lord, where we want to lash out, want to get angry, or we need to, need to be entreated, that we may submit to thy spirit, that we might be easily entreated. May you bless us, dear Lord, that we might be a blessing in a tree of life as we speak to those that we come in contact with this day. This is my prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Thanks for being with me here on Revive Reform Radio. I pray that you may continue to walk with the King. Mm -hmm.